finish with the equation and uninterpreted functions. We had the last example or two examples for uninterpreted functions and how to eliminate them. So here you can see a very simple formula with equations and uninterpreted functions. And we would like to transform it back to pure equality logic. What we do is, as we have seen on, on Monday, we just take each occurrence of my uninterpreted function. And with each occurrence, I mean where the parameters are syntactically different. And I introduce a new, um, new symbol, like a variable, for each occurrence. So f of x1 becomes f1, and f of x2 becomes f2. And I just keep the information that they are equal. Similar, here of f of x1, the parameters of this first occurrence are syntactically equal, so I can use the same symbol. And I can state that this is not equal to f of x3, which will be encoded by f3. So now some information are missing, namely the information that these are functions. So if x1 equals x2, then also f of x1 will be equal f of x2. That means f1 will equal f2. And this is the congruence. It is encoded <coughs> the following way. I have three occurrences. For all three, I state pairwise that if the parameter is equal, then also the function values equal. So if x1 equals x2, this is for these two occurrences here, then also f1 will equal f2. For 1 and 3, if x1 equals x3, this is for this invocation and this, then also f1 will equal f3. And the last pair is if x2 equals x3, then also f2 will equal f3. Sorry, this is uh, superfluous. So you see, this is twice. I just didn't want to change it because then we can have one five for the annotated slide. And the, the formula which we check is the conjunction of these two. So I take the encoding, where I just represent the function values by variables, and I put to it the congruence between the function applications. OK, a last example. We have here two implementations of basically the same functionality. The first one takes an input in. It stores it in out, and it will uh, multiply out within two times. So what comes out is in times in times in. The second implementation does this, this uh, immediately. So it assumes that this variable out, as you can see, this is local. The parameter in is also local. That means if I invoke one of these methods in a program and then replace it by the other implementation, is it possible to recognize any differences between them? So somewhere I have an invocation. <coughs> um, let's say x becomes power 3 of a variable, let's say v. And if I, it's now, uh, if I now um, replace it by power 3b of v, at the same place, I just replace one method called by another. Can I have a different behavior in my program? No. Not what the regarding the values. The strongest difference that I can get is in time. So for example, if I have a parallel um, program, then this might take a bit longer, though actually probably it will not. But regarding the values, it is the same input-output behavior. And since the variables are local, all variables are local, we say that these methods have the same ob observable behavior externally observable behavior. OK, and now we would like to prove it, that this is the case. How can we do it? We just uh, write some formulas. One formula in that we 
um, fix the values which are returned. So for the first <coughs> method, power 3, we could write out at the uh, definition has the value in. Then after the first change in the value out, after executing this assignment one time, I become out 1 equals out 0 times in. Then this loop, uh, this um, for loop will be executed a second time. So the new value of out will be out 1 times in. This encodes the computation of the first method. Now the computation of the second method is just out, and I encode now the value with b, equals in times in times in. And now the behavior equivalence can be stated by the following formula. If the first method does this computation and the second does this computation, then the outputs are equal. So now we have one problem by checking this formula is that we have integers with multiplication. This logic is undecided, but there is no complete decision procedure for it. So we could try to invoke some proverbs, but termination is not guaranteed. And now you can see why it is sometimes too good good to have uninterpreted functions, because actually the meaning of the multiplication is not important in this sense. I also could have put in addition. This would also hold. So this property here is not specific for the multiplication. I do not need its semantics for showing it to be valid. What we can do is, in this case, abstract away from the meaning of the multiplication and just take it as uninterpreted function. We have these occurrences of the multiplication, and we just take an uninterpreted function g. Now, it can be multiplication, can be also anything else, and I, g is applied here to out 0 and in. In this application, it is applied to out, zero and, or out 1 and in. And the last one is a nested application, namely, Um, first, I imply g to in and in, and then I apply g to the result and in again. So this is our formula, and now we can solve it. We can first uh, eliminate the uninterpreted function. How many invocations do I have? Syntactically different applications of the function g? Four. So I will need first uh, four um, variables, g1, g2, g3 is now not visible in the formula, and g4. So the equations I let as they, as they are, but the invocations of the function I just replaced by their variable now. So this one by g1, this one by g2, this one by g3, and this invocation by g4. The rest remains the same. And now I have to encode congruence. That means if the parameters of the first and the second invocation are the same, then also their values. So if out 0 equals out 1, this is here, and in equals in, then g1 equals g2. <laughs> the same for one, 1 and 3. If out 0 equals in and in equals in, this is here, then g1 equals g3. Then between 1 and 4, if out 0 equals, and now I take the variable g3, and in equals in, then g1 equals g4. And the same I do for 2, 3, 2, 4, and 3, 4. And now if I make the conjunction of flat and cong, then I have an equality logic formula where I can apply again our um, equality graph-based method to encode transitivity. So I will replace each equation by a propositional logic variable, and I will encode the transitivity of the equation. Then I get a propositional logic formula, and then we can use such solving to solve, um, to check the formula for satisfiability. 
And basically, what we also could have done, what we did not do, we say that if phi1 and phi2 holds, then the outputs are equal. So if I check it for satisfiability, what do I get? Which statement do I get by checking this formula for satisfiability? What will be the answer? Is this formula satisfiable? So that C1 encodes the input-output behavior of the first method. Phi2 encodes the input-output behavior of the second method. And Phi3 says that if the input-output behavior of the first method and the second method is valid, that means it is the real behavior, then the outputs are the same for the same input. Now I check Phi3 for satisfiability. What will I get? Is it satisfiable or unsatisfiable? It's satisfiable. But now I only get the information satisfiable. Does it mean that the two outputs are equivalent? No. But shall, should I have checked for? Instead of satisfiability, I should have checked for validity. Yeah? If it is valid, then I know that um, the input-output behavior are, is the same. So basically, I could negate this formula and search for a counterexample. Where for the same input, they give the same output. And then, if this is unsatisfiable, then I would know, again, that the input-output behaviors are the same. So that's why satisfiability and validity are dual. By negating, you can always um, answer for the same problem, both questions with the same methods. Okay. <clears throat> Do you have questions for... Which is in yeah. no, you can skip them. Okay. So equalities between syntactically equal state uh, terms you can just delete. Okay. Mm -hmm. And why is the G three missing in phi flat? Because it is a parameter of this invocation. Okay. So it is a kind of hidden. If I would have done it stepwise, then I would just have replaced this by G1, this by G2, I replace this by G3, but then I replace this whole by G4. So that's why it is hidden. But the connections are there due to the congruence. Would it be wrong if I add G3 to phi flat? How? It is not in the formula. So I get the flat formula just by replacing each invocation of G by a fresh variable. And I did it. I replaced this by G3. But then I replaced also this by G4. That's why it, is, it has fallen out. Uh, so does it only work in this example because the methods are syntactically, syntactically identical if you write it down? Right? So if, if the second method would not be in times in, Times in, but in times, in times in, then it would match and you could do it, right? You could do the same. Uh, because, uh, let us check. Um, so what you say is here I have I G of... Uh, here? Um, Or do I want more back? Yeah, here. So if I would have here in times, in times in, this is what you would like to have, yeah? yeah. <coughs> Then we would have here G of in, G of in, in. Yeah? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah you, you, you are right. So we could go on. Here we would have still the same, but these two parameters would be exchanged. So the change would be here um, by G4. 
if out one would equal in and uh, two for if out two and four out one would equal in and in would equal g three and here also and here. This would be the difference. And uh, basically, I check now for satisfiability. Yeah, what would I get? This would be still satisfiable. If I would now take the negation, I would check for counterexample where the outputs are not the same. Then perhaps I would get um, I would get problems here. I, I'm pretty sure that it would be still satisfiable. But what I actually wanted to say is, I am not 100% uh, sure if if uh, the negation would be unsatisfiable in this respect. But I, but what we see is what is missing, is that it is not only a function but it also symmetric. Yeah. But what we but the difference between the two applications is that x or g of x y equals g of y x. Yeah, multiplication. Uh, yeah, but in this, um, yeah, but I think we do not need associativity here. But perhaps. There is some application. You don't need both, but it should be uh, balanced if one of these two uh, properties follows for the function. Yeah. But Something like that. Exactly. And this is what is called uh, counterexample guided abstractions refinement. Perhaps you have heard it. It is a very general approach. SIGA. SIGA. Counterexample guided abstraction refinement. So you have often very complex systems, and then you make some abstraction in order to be able to handle it. Uninterpreted functions is a widely used method for building abstractions of systems. And now, of course, you hope that your abstraction is not too strong, such that you still see everything that you need for proving your system to be correct. But sometimes it is not the case. For example, if you now um, make this change to our computations, so method three does not compute in times in, times in, but in times in times in, it is a small change, but perhaps it will result in now yeah, that, that we need some more information about this function g in order to show that they are still behavior equivalent. And what you can do is, Still, in equation and uninterpreted functions, you can add some information. Without defining what multiplication means, you could state that this operation is symmetric or that it is associative by just adding this, this information to the encoding. And this is a refinement of your abstraction. Now this function, function g, is not just a function. It is a symmetric function or an associ associative function uh, or operation. And then with this information you can recheck, and if you still get an answer which you did not expect, then you can try to add further information to your system. This is the same, for example, if you have um, a circuit. This we had also last time. It has some input, computes something, and has some output. And it has a part in it. Most of all, if these parts are, um, it <laughs> contain some memory, then it becomes rather complex to reason about it. And then you can say that this is a black box. I think that my property doesn't depend on the behavior of this black box. But nevertheless, it might be important if there are some, for example, if there is some memory inside, what I know is that if I put in something and get out something, the next time I will put in the same thing, I will get the same. That means it is a deterministic system. 
and then I can encode this just as, a, as an uninterpreted function g of, yeah, in this case, has two parameters, and it gives out two parameters. Okay, then I state my property, perhaps negated, so I search for counterexamples where my property doesn't hold, and I find one. Then the question is, is my system buggy, or is my abstraction too strong? So what I can do is try to refine my abstraction and put in some more information from this black box into my formula until finally I refine the whole black box. That means it is concretized completely, and I still have a counterexample. At that moment, I know that my system is buggy. OK. More questions? Good. Um, since there are only 12 minute, minutes left, I, I think there is it's not so good to start with a new. But perhaps I can just show you without going to uh, Without going in detail, just show you a general approach, and then next time on Monday we will uh, talk about SMT solving. What we have seen until now is propositional logic and sub solving, and we looked at equalities and uninterpreted functions, which we can transform back to propositional logic and therefore can use sub solving. We also looked at first to the theories, and we know that there are more complex theories, which are, of course, more expressive, such that the transformation back to proposition logic is not possible anymore. And in this, um, these logics, we, we take a different approach for solving, and this is SAT modulo theory solving. There is a first example, since we have now soon Christmas, <coughs> we have Santa Claus, and Santa Claus uh, needs some presence, and we have some restrictions. First, he wants to reduce the overhead by making only two types of three types of presence which he is able to do. And he needs at least 100 presence, and needs at least five of either type 1 or type 2, and at least 10 of the third type. I mean, there are some wishes which uh, he cannot neglect. So now he should be able to do it in time, and he should have enough money to um, make these productions. So presence of type 1, 2, and 3 need 1, 2, respectively 5 minutes. And Santa Claus had, has 3 hours for making these presents. Each present of type 1, 2, and 3 costs also something, namely 3, 2, respectively 1 euro and he has 300 euros in total for the present. So the question is, can he manage to, to produce the present under these uh, conditions? Such um, um, problems you can find a lot everywhere. They are also nice to just think about them, but for more complicated problems, they are also relevant for industrial applications. For example, this is only Santa Claus, but if you have some um, production line, it is very important, for example, to use the resources optimally. Also that you, of course, can finance uh, what you need for the production and so on. And those problems are, if the functions are linear, then these are linear optimization problems. Uh, they are not trivial to solve per hand, so we need some solution mechanisms for them. Who of you already know simplex? So some, we will also look at simplex. Simplex is used for uh, optimizing a set of constraints under some goal function. But now what you see here, <coughs> if we encode this problem, then we have some constraints which are conjunctive, for example, here that the number of presents must be at least 100, but 
the first condition here says that he only would like to make two types. That means one of the types will not be produced. And this is a disjunction. So this is something which you cannot solve, for example, by using simplex. By simpl simplex can be used only for a set of constraints, that means for a conjunction of constraints. So let us look first short at this uh, encoding. To finish it, so he would like to make only two types. That means if we encode the number of presence of that 1, 2, 3 by P1, P2, and P3, then the first item condition can be encoded by P1 equals 0, or P2 equals 0, or P3 equals 0. Then he needs at least 100 presence. That means that the sum of P1, P2, and P3 must be larger or equal 100. He needs at least five of type 1 or 2. It's encoded here. Either P1 is larger or equal than 5, or P2 is larger or equal 5. And for the third type, he needs at least 10. So P3 is larger or equal 10. Then we know that the presence of type 1, 2, 3 need 1, 2, and 5 minutes, and he has 3 hours, which is equal to 150, 180 sec, uh, minute, minutes. So P1 plus 2 times P2, because 2 needs 2 time units per item, and plus 5 times P3, because the third type needs 5 minutes per item, is less than equal 180. And the last condition is regarding the cost. Type of 1 costs 3 euro, type 2 costs uh, 2 euro, type 3, 1. So 3 times P1 plus 2 times P2 but plus P3 is less than equal 300, which is the amount of money which he has. <coughs> so what we will now do in the next lessons is to look at how can we solve such constraints such uh, formulas for satisfiability. First, we abstract away from this problem. We will come back to it later. <coughs> but what we see here is what is the type of the variables in this case. Number of presents. Integer, especially uh, non-negative integer. <coughs> and what we have is uh, besides comparison operators plus. So we are now in the logic, actually over the nature numbers, but we can also write set for the integers. <coughs> we have some constants, we have addition, and we have comparison. This is linear integer arithmetic, which is still decidable. But we, what we will look at first is linear real arithmetic. Um, there we will look at variable elimination technique simplex, then we will use simplex also for integers. This will, this is, will be called branch and bound. And before we do that, we look already now if we have these methods. That means if I can check the conjunction of constraints from some theory. How can I use it to check the satisfiability of arbitrary Boolean combinations? So this is called SAT modulo series solving. And it is called SAT because it has a SAT solver component and modulo series because I can plug in into this uh, picture a series solver. This is independent first in the big picture from the theory. Of course, if I have a certain logic which I want to solve, for example, linear arithmetic, then I have here SAT solver to a kind of handle the Boolean structure of my formula. And then I could, for example, have here a simplex solver to check conjunctions of linear arithmetic constraints. So how does it work? First, we have a formula like here. And I make a Boolean abstraction. This we already know for equality logic. In equality logic, we replace each equation by a proposition logic formula. And now we will replace each constraint from my theory by a propositional logic formula. So for example, for this formula, I can take a propositional logic variable A1 for P1 equals 0. And I do this for all. 
And then what I get is this formula. This is a proposition logic formula. And this is called the Boolean skeleton, because it is just the Boolean structure of my problem. And um, we stop here now. So what we will look next time is how I can use this Boolean skeleton to, um, to solve my, the Boolean structure of my problem and how is it combined with solving theories. Uh, theory problems. Okay, thank you. <laughs>